Aloha, welcome to Ehana Kako, a weekly program on ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. My name is Kaylee Iakina, president of Grassroot Institute, and I welcome you today. We're talking about something that should be very dear and near to the heart of every citizen and every parent in Hawaii, and that's the education of our keiki. Uh, it's something that we all need to work together, and that's why we say Ehana Kako. Let's work together. I'm very pleased that my good friend today, Lynn Finnegan, is joining us. Uh, she has been a true champion for education in our state, and uh, many of you know that she has had a, a tremendously varied career as an educator herself, as well as uh, a member of our House of Representatives. Uh, she's been involved in many different ways in making Hawaii a better place to live and in promoting education. We welcome her today and her organization that she is now the executive director of, the Hawaii Public Charter School Network. Lynn, thanks Aloha. for coming on board. Aloha. Yes. Aloha. It's great so to be here. So glad to see you. Yes, it's my pleasure. You know, you do so much. I don't know how you have all the time <laughs> no, and the, the no, energy no. and so forth, but thanks for joining us today on Ehana Kako. It's my pleasure. Now, tell me just a moment so we get this right at the very beginning. Okay. What is the name and nature of your organization, of which you are the executive director now? Sure. The Hawaii Public Charter Schools Network, and basically it's a network of charter schools across the the state. We have um, we have schools that uh, have students across the whole state right. in blended and online environments, but we also have uh, schools on Kauai, uh, Kauai uh, Maui, uh, Molokai, the Big Island, and Oahu. So it's a broad network that, that brings people together who are supplementing what we're doing in the public school system. Absolutely. We're public schools funded by the public taxpayer dollar, um, and we provide public education, and it's a choice school for well, Hawaii students. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. First, I, I'd like to just chat a little with you Thank on you. what has brought you to this place in which you play such an important role in building education for our community. Now, you started out, what was your first job? My first job yes. ever? That's right. <laughs> My first job ever. Let me see. I flipped burgers at Burger King, if you're talking about there first you go. job so ever. So you were a, a working <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but, but you and I got to know each other, actually, when you were a state legislator yes, in the House yes, of Representatives. Yes. And that was for about how long? I was there for eight years. Eight years. Yeah. And what were some of the issues you focused on? What were some of the accomplishments that you, you really liked to th think back about? Well, I like to think back about education uh -huh. and, you know, having that voice for education and, and school choice and, and making sure that the dollar reaches the classroom and talking about those kinds of issues that, you know, in a in a Department of Education where, you know, we're one of the larger departments uh, across right. the nation, um, that you know, to constantly bring to the conversation on public education that we need to look at how we can do things as efficiently as possible and meeting the needs of individual Absolutely. students. Absolutely. In fact, Lynn, I think it'd be safe to say that, that you'd already shown and proven your credentials in promoting education long before you, you landed the position you're in. I mean, you have advocated for building our public school system, having a quality education for every child. Absolutely. As a, as a mom, mm -hmm. you know, you with uh, two young children, uh, I came across needing to find um, an educational environment that supported their ways of learning. And, you know, I have two great kids, and at the time we're a young family that uh, we were trying to look, you know, should we go public, should we go private, in choosing our charter, uh, our education, and we ended up going um, in the direction, my daughter was kindergarten at the time, choosing a public charter school. Mm. So, now, following your career in the legislature, mm -hmm. you, you made a run for lieutenant governor. That's correct. Well, what, what led you to seek a broader role, a broader office? You know, it was a variety of things. I think um, at the time, I had uh, eight years in at the mm -hmm. legislature, sure. you know, did on uh, small business issues as well as uh, education and school choice. 
um, and was able to really kind of resonate with people within my district, but wanted to take that message to a, sure. to a statewide message as much as possible and decided that it would be a good idea at the time, you know, um, uh, Lieutenant Governor Iona was running for office and he was seeking governorship and I thought, you know, this would be a sure. really good m mm -hmm. move. And between my husband and I, we decided that it would be a good move for yeah, us. And I, I remember talking about that at the time. That, that, that struck me, uh, that it was important to you that your husband and you were both lined up together. Absolutely. Uh, because it, it, was certain, it would certainly affect his life. <laughs> Definitely. And, and, and then I remember, of course, uh, we joked about this, that, right. that, that uh, you might one day have a driver, but until then, he was your driver. <laughs> he, he drove you where you needed and to go. And in more senses of the word than just, you know, the automobile. He really helps me to stay focused on the needs, not just when I'm in my, you know, in my role as a legislature. He's a, a sure. good sound footing um, mm -hmm. for what's happening in everyday life outside of the political realm. So, well, that's something. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, in fact, it's a partnership, I, I'd like to say this to our audience here. I've had the, the privilege of knowing Lynn for many, many years on a personal level. She's come out and supported me in my work in the public and with charity and in leadership building in, in Hawaii. And uh, I can tell you, she's the real thing when it comes to caring about what a family is and building up her own family and being involved in the community. And so to me, I'm, I'm just very Thanks, pleased Katie. that that comes together with the political side and it's also part of your work in public school uh, promotion and charter schools as well today. Yeah. Now, now, let me ask you this question as you go back and reflect upon your political career, both as a legislator mm -hmm. and as a candidate. What have you learned about Hawaii in that process? How, how, what do you know about Hawaii today far more than you knew before you were part of the political career? Um. You know, I guess, I, I guess, I, in a general sense, I didn't learn anything absolutely new. You know, I knew Hawaii's culture was a very loving one that, you know, reached out to people and, you know, didn't necessarily like the conflict and like getting along and working together. Um, and it was a, you know, it, it was getting used to being able to speak that language. I, you know, I've become especially in the legislature as being the real minority voice in the legislature that oftentimes you feel that you need to you know stand up for what you believe in and you should do sure. that you know it's just a matter of um, making sure that when you communicate that it doesn't strike um, as uh, come across as being so so much of a conflict for people and just try to really do your mm -hmm. best to to speak your mind and speak your position but also to look for ways to collaborate you know and and that's right. really important now, now you were minority leader or minority floor leader minority leader and yes. as the minority leader you really had to walk the walk of what you just said you, Absolutely. you really had to practice uh, this value of standing clearly for what you believe in mm -hmm. which i know you always have but to doing it in such a way that conveys respect, Absolutely. doing it in a way that opens rather than closes doors and so forth. Tell me a little bit about that. What, what have you learned? Because I think that's very relevant mm -hmm. to the kind of work you want to do in education. Absolutely. I think, you know, the more you, you, you know, in formal avenues for learning about leadership, it's, uh, it's been talked about a lot where, you know, how do you get people to, to move in the right direction or in the same direction? And it isn't always that you take a hammer and you say, okay, my way is the right way. But really trying to bring as many people around so that they can embrace the direction that you're going in and, and listening to what people have to say. And, um, and that's, what we, you know, that's what we try to do in education. You know, there's always two sides to every story. There's always reasons whether, like in school choice, there's um, across the nation you have strong union states and weaker union states. And there's always this balance between, uh, you know, is why do you need unions in the first place? Well, because you need certain protections of the employees. You know, and then on the other hand, it's like, but you need to have the flexibility to meet the needs that your children have in an educational setting. So being able to take, take those two issues, bring it together, and working toward a solution for, um, you know, solution for those issues. And you had been working in that arena of, of how can we take the point of view 
from one side and another side and create solutions Absolutely. in the legislature and you're bringing it now into the educational realm because those issues you talk about, unions, uh, em employees, the public, the government, yes. they're, they're all present there in a, in a, a microcosm sense in, in that, like that. And, and the reason why I love education in Hawaii and across the nation is because it's one of the issues that even though you have stark contrasts between what one side or the other side feels, um, at the end of the day, everyone wants to focus on better education mm. for kids, and so it's a constant drifting toward collaboration. Absolutely, you know, and um, and it may not always work, but I think for the most part, the hearts and minds of people want it to work. Well, I love that word collaboration, and you really are a model of creating collaboration, Lynn. I, I'm going to, for a program note, to talk to our producer Jay Fidel just a moment here and ask if this is a good time for us to take a break, uh, and uh, if so, I'll go ahead and uh, initiate one. <laughs> and, uh, we'll it's just a great time That's <laughs> wonderful. He said it's a great time, in case you didn't hear that. Yeah. This is Kaylee Akina on Ehana Kako, a weekly program that means let's work together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm the president of Grassroot Institute. My guest today is the executive director of the Hawaii Public Charter School Network, Lynn Finnegan, and we'll be right back and talk about education after this. Aloha and welcome back to a Hana Kako. Let's work together. A weekly program on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm delighted th today to be talking with our guest Lynn Finnegan, who is the executive director of the Hawaii Public Charter School Network. Lynn, yes. uh, as we pick up again, okay. um, let's be realistic about the work that needs to be done. Okay. Um, one of the wonderful things about Hawaii is that people have values mm -hmm. and care deeply about those values. Sometimes values are divided between Democratic Party values, Republican mm -hmm. Party values, and you're a Republican. Mm -hmm. In Grassroot Institute, we're nonpartisan, and, and we're always looking for those points of intersection around issues where we can work together. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm very interested in what you're doing, because even though you very strongly hold to your political beliefs mm -hmm. as a Republican, you found ways of working with Democrats in a predominantly Democrat state. What are, what are some of the first the challenges of doing that in the educational realm? Um, I, I think it's not only towards education yes. that you find those same types of challenges, but you know it's understanding the issue, um, making sure that it's fair and that it take that it uh, th that we progress in an issue. It's really tough to get like certain messages um, through, mm -hmm. especially when you're working in a legislative session where you have you know 76 sure. different you know opinions possibly, um, and a governor in a in a process. Um, 
um, that can can move pretty slowly. It used we. I, I was told when I was first elected that, you know, a bill takes seven to eight years before it passes the legislature, um, and I thought, oh my goodness, do we get anything right. done here? But, but you know? not all bills. Some, not all bills. Some, some, some take are seven fast to eight days. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not all bills. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I I would say that um, in education right now, you know, there's. A lot of the times where we find our stale, you know, where things aren't moving forward or we're, we're facing gridlock is usually in the areas where there's not clear communication or that you're not making good efforts to communicate clearly. So what I'm hearing uh, the, uh, you say basically is that most people out there working for the quality of our schools are of goodwill. Yes. And, yes, and the problem absolutely. is, first of all, getting good messages through because sometimes they can get politicized mm -hmm. and those without political power aren't able to champion the right messages. So part of your work is just that, the communication of issues and, and so forth. Yes, and communicating issues takes a lot of hard work. You know, we just finished, uh, for the charter schools, we just finished in 2012, the ending of that session, we did a whole new revamping of the charter school sure. law. And, you know, it's this, it's this balancing act of how can you create um, a, a system where schools have autonomy, but yet make sure that there's accountability. And accountability comes with a lot of rules and regulations, a lot of times, and reporting, rules, regulations, and reporting. Sure. And on the other side of uh, autonomy, you have like this freeing up to innovate, you know, this space. So oftentimes, if you overregulate or you put in too many rules or overreport, then the folks in the innovative sector or, or innovative place will find it very difficult. Well, you know, to I have think that done. This is an excellent place for us to to pause now and, and, and turn our conversation a little mo bit more on charter schools, mm -hmm. uh, because in your role as the Hawaii Public Charter Schools Network executive director, you're dealing with an entity that not everybody really knows about. People know what the public school, traditional public school is, yes. the one that sits in your neighborhood and has a big sign in front of it and has been there for maybe 50 years. People know what a private school mm -hmm. is, but Lynn, what, what is, is a charter, public charter school? Yes, and not only that, you're right, not only a charter school, but a public charter school. Right. What, what is this animal? Well, it is an animal, and when you describe like what it looks like in Hawaii, it looks quite different from in other states. Sure. So in other states, you have almost a private school that is funded by public dollars. By so, the way, uh, for those who may know New York, Bronx School of Science and the Magnet Schools and the Performing Arts School, are those charter schools, public charter schools Public as well? charter schools, yes. So that's one kind of public charter school. Correct, schools. correct. But let me let you get on with defining sure, sure. it and telling us what kind of charter schools we have. So in the case of, um, in the case all throughout the country you have charter schools and charter schools sometimes operate with uh, union agreements and okay. sometimes not. Um, and there's a variety of unions. So you could have uh, a union that just represents that school or that school system. We have unions for the whole state and our charter schools are under um, collective bargaining. Okay, so first of all, these charter schools are public schools. Yes. And the employees of these charter schools are part of the union system. Correct. Okay, the Hawaii State Teachers Association. Yes, yeah. and uh, HGEA. And HGEA as government. well, yes. of course. So we've you got the them. jurisdiction, so to speak, mm -hmm. defined. Now define what the thing is. <laughs> what, what, yes. what exactly uh, does a parent and a student encounter when the child goes to one of these public charter schools? So, in general, when you're looking at a traditional Hawaii Department of Education school, it's a geographic location, okay. and it's a school that represents or that serves its geographic right. location. Traditionally, they're district. Correct. And in charter schools, they're public schools of choice. So what you have now is you have uh, schools, public charter schools that are located in different parts of the state. And you can choose whether or not you want to go to that school or another school, just like you would a private school in oh, that way. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Would, would, would the school at the university? Uh, lab school? Lab school? Yes. University High School, is that what it's, it's called? It's a now? university laboratory okay. school. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the charter schools? Yes. It okay. used to so be. So it's been around quite a right, while. Right, right. But it, it, it didn't come under the charter school label 
until uh, 1990, nine, 1990s. Um, prior to that, it was a part of the okay. university. So a I charter mean, school part of the DOE system. is a school that doesn't draw its population from the geography necessarily, right. the, the district it's, it's in, choice, yeah. but people apply to get into these charter schools mm -hmm. from anywhere in the state. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And are they organized around a certain theme, or they is can it the be. quality uh, because of education? They're, uh, for the most part, we've adopted in Hawaii, we've adopted community-driven schools. Okay. So a lot of our schools across the state have some kind of focus, whether it be STEM, mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, okay. and math, whether it be project-based learning, where you're learning not only through uh, you know books and all of that, but you're l learning by using your hands, and it's kind of that kind of approach, where you're using projects to learn real life sure. you know, skills and and uh, using project-based learning. If there's, there's any, uh, uh, sorry to cut you off no, here, go, go ahead. ahead. There's uh, other things like blended learning where they all have right. online mm -hmm. schools where you have access to all kinds of um, all kinds of courses that can be online as well as going into a physical location. Um, and we have Hawaiian focused and Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian language schools, okay. which uh, a good amount of our schools here, because one of the interesting things is we have this constitutional mandate that talks about Hawaiian culture education mm -hmm. in Hawaii, but there is no real there there weren't there wasn't a real way to obtain that um, in the state, and so many of the Hawaiian uh, culture type communities had said that they you know they wanted that for their community and started applying as charter schools. And these are the Hawaiian charter schools or the Hawaiian immersion language yeah, charter yeah, schools we as have, well. We have Hawaiian immersion mm -hmm. uh, language charter schools, Hawaiian charter, uh, culture charter schools. Okay, so it sounds to me as though members of the community mm -hmm. can come together around this concept of a public charter school. Mm -hmm. Their tax dollars can be used to create an environment for education along things that that community Cares feels about, important, yes. whether it's Hawaiian culture, Hawaiian language, agriculture, science, agriculture, yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so in a sense, Hawaii public charter schools allow for the creation of greater choice yes. in, in the way parents spend their tax dollars, in, in the way communities control or engage with the mm -hmm. education. That's correct. Well, I, I want to pause right here sure. because we're going to take a quick break, but I want to punctuate this because earlier we were talking about winning. The, the communication battle, and that is to say where oftentimes there may be one perspective and another perspective that create gridlock. What Lynn has been trying to do all her career is find ways to communicate through that gridlock. Sometimes there's gridlock around the word choice itself because of the way it has been used in other parts of the nation, the way it has characterized movements and so forth. But very clearly the Hawaii public charter schools empower parents and uh, citizens in general to have more choice. I'd like to explore that a little bit that's further. And, and that's a great value for the organization I represent, Grassroot Institute, because we believe in personal liberty and choice and in the right of individuals to determine where their tax dollars go. I'm Kaylee Akina, president of Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. My guest today is Lynn Finnegan of the Hawaii Public Charter Schools Network. Uh, we always say thanks to uh, our, our Hawaii Think Tech Hawaii organization led by Jay Fidel, and we will be right back talking about education after this quick break. Welcome. Okay.
Welcome back to a Hana Kako Let's Work Together, a weekly program on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kaylee Akina, president of Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and my guest today is Lynn Finnegan, the executive director of the Hawaii Public Charter Schools Network. And I'm delighted that we've been talking about some important things. Lynn, I yes. have to tell you this, and then during the break, we were kind of marveling at this. A lot of us, including myself, really have are not up to speed in our knowledge of what's out there with mm -hmm. the public charter schools. Uh, one of the things that I was impressed about in our last segment is that it, charter schools really give and uh, empower parents yes. with more choices mm -hmm. as to how to get their children educated. And it should be. It should be a partnership with the um, Hawaii Department of Education yes. to make sure that all the schools, well, all the families and their kids' um, needs are met, right? And that's what we focus on is, you know, our families and uh, kids are the educational environment, you know, uh, supporting uh, that child's learning. Well, let's talk for just a moment about some of those choices that sure. exist right now. You mentioned a couple of them already that, that people might be interested in, and that that were uh, those were the Hawaiian schools, the Hawaiian mm -hmm. culture schools, or the Hawaiian immersion schools. Language schools, yes. And uh, I'm part Hawaiian, and uh, that that certainly is of interest to me for children I know. Um, friends and others who and uh, are those only for Hawaiians or can anyone no, else say no. so anyone in the state can yes. say I'd like my child to go to a Hawaiian language immersion school correct and correct. by the way before we move on to other choices does that mean that's the only thing they learn Hawaiian no. language no, 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 no. I think that's an important question yeah yes um, no they don't only learn Hawaiian they learn language. outstanding English yes they Absolutely. learn English they learn math they learn all of the things that you need to learn uh, we're held to all the fate uh, the federal and state you know requirements sure. and state tests we still have to perform those in fact this might be of interest uh, I've looked at studies that are produced about immersion schools on the mainland mm -hmm. Chinese immersion schools other language immersion schools and it would probably also be true of Hawaiian language immersion schools that the students who learn a particular language whether it be Hawaiian or Chinese by simultaneously learning their English actually come out as better English practitioners as a I result of that. I wouldn't doubt that. I wouldn't doubt that at all. Um, so it's, it's, it's great, I mean, in that sense. Well, it definitely is. And, you know, it depends on, uh, there's, there's a lot of things, especially with the Hawaiian Focus and Hawaiian sure. um, Immersion School, um, you know, it's about, like, at times, you know, for different students, it might be about identity, and then that helps to firm their grasp so, on who they are. How about that? And at times, that connects them. And now, you know, they perform much better than they would in an environment without Hawaiian how culture. How about that? So there's there are different things like that that I think, you know, supports. Like I said, the individual needs of that student. Tell us a little bit more about some other kinds of choices that exist in the. Charter sure, school. sure. Oh, one that's, I, I had just, there was an article about one of our schools, uh, West Hawaii Explorations Academy. Okay. They're going to, they're a school up on the, um, near the airport over in uh, Kona. All right. And when you go there, if you, you land in the Kona airport and all you see is like black rock, right? Right. And then, uh, all that lava. yeah, all that lava. And so right around the corner is this school. It's uh, known for being the school without walls. Um, there's a couple tents up, there's a, 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 a portable uh, as a part of their school campus. And they also have the only shark tank. Shark there. tank. And the shark tank was built by a student and her father. How about that? Yeah. And uh, it was a project because they're project based learning and they're science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and they do tours for, I, th I think they met their 25,000 um, student visitor. Uh, at wow. their school. Yeah. So we're not only seeing the emphasis on science here, we also see the opportunity to learn about tourism yes, as a result absolutely. of this. Yes, absolutely. They do another project where they go and they teach tourists about uh, caring for the environment and the beaches. Um, and they do That's wonderful. this work with tourists, yeah. Quickly, tell me about a few more of these, these choices. Sure, this sure. is fascinating. <laughs> it's great stuff. It's great stuff. We have a new school that I'll talk about. Uh, it's called the SEEQS, S-E-E-Q-S, -E -E right. the School for Examining Essential Questions. Um, and basically, they're going to be a project-based learning school about science. Um, they've just been approved. They're a middle school, uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Uh, they're a very small school right now, and they're, they're finding their way, you know, um, starting up. But 
just a really good school that's going to be about you know learning about environmental wow. issues. That's and, wonderful. Yeah, and, and so talking. What are those what is the range of, of themes or programs around which charter schools are organized? Uh, well, it depends because we do have, like I said, you know, the language. language we have online right, and culture. blended learning culture methodology, um, like methodology, or yeah, other and sometimes types. Uh, pedagogy in the way that okay. you know how can we do this differently? And they may bring in different types of sure. instruction and, okay. and curriculum, like kind of like a laboratory for yeah, a education. laboratory. It's it's um, it's pretty fascinating and. The exciting part about it is we still have room to grow and we still have room. Oh, I would room. imagine. The sky's yeah. the limit. And really. we, the universe and, is the yeah. limit. Yeah, and we still have room for other things. Like we don't necessarily have like a fine arts program sure. or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we don't necessarily have, um, it would be great to have like a medical, medically focused sure. type of environment or wow, construction, well, you know, all of those different things. Do you have an entrepreneurial school? We have schools that have programs uh -huh. within them, but they're, the whole school is not based upon an entrepreneurial type. Well, we have a, a son who is an entrepreneur extraordinaire. Yes. And uh, entrepreneurship, buying and selling things, mm -hmm. captures his imagination. If he could have education around that, yes. that Wouldn't would that motivate great? him in subjects that he may be less motivated in. Yeah. So let's say I'm a parent. Yes. And I feel this way. Mm -hmm. What's the process now for getting a charter school? If I can find some other parents or yeah. other people in the community who want to rally around a certain theme, and that's exactly what you do. It's basically, you know, say if a nonprofit organization or a you know group says sure. this is lacking, we would like to see, we would like to open a school, mm -hmm. and we want it to be from K through six or K through twelve or whatever, and this is the theme. They'd start to do research around that and see if other people would like to have that kind of educational environment for their kids. You get supporters, uh -huh. you build your application, you submit your application to the state charter school commission. And then they will decide what the need is. Um, if you have all your ducks in a row, if you've done your financial plan, they review all of those things. They ask you what your objectives and goals are. And then you, if approved, you go into a contract um, that basically said, says, here's what we promise to produce. How about that? Yeah. And then um, if you do well, then the contract is renewed. What's the time frame to go from the first organizational step mm -hmm. to success? What's on an average? Success of being That's approved? Of being approved. Okay. I would say, um, you know, it's taken, we, we're adjusting to a new uh -huh. law sure. right now. My guesstimation as to a process timeline for from the initial organizing to being approved, if all goes well, you'd probably be looking at at least a couple years. Okay, so let's say we're looking at two years here just mm -hmm. for that process. Mm -hmm. Then once you, approval is granted, how much time before doors open? I was thinking about two years. Oh, included yes, in that, that as would well. Be including so we the... could have the doors open. Mm -hmm. if, if someone has a, a, a child who's in seventh grade right now, they could be going to high school in a charter school. It's possible. That's new. Yes. That's possible. But yeah. that, that'd be, and you would really have to have right. you know everything uh, done well. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. and um, and that's what we're trying to focus on as the Hawaii Public Charter Schools Network is that ability to support okay. people through that well, process. As tell well. me a little bit about scale. Well, what what kind of numbers are we looking at? What's necessary in terms of the number of sponsors or students and so forth before we can actually open the doors? What would be the smallest Charter school. Well, I'll give you an example on the Sikhs, the school that is starting up this year. Um, they are starting up with a financial plan, uh, with getting some other supports as well. So you do some fundraising to build up your kitty to be, you know, be able to start open your school. Um, but they were able to open their school with 55 kids. 55 kids. That's not probably that? like the sustainable you yes, know, number. Yes, what would be a sustainable a number? A sustainable number would, would be more along the lines of, if, especially if you're only you're ma mainly depending upon the state's per sure. pupil money, then you'd probably looking be looking between 150 to 300 students. Okay, so basically what you're saying is that and I'm going to say this to our audience as well, if you can go out there and mobilize a community group that can invest at least two years or more in, in working hard to go through the process and recruit maybe two or three hundred students, you can actually open up 
a charter school. Is, is it can, that simple then? Uh, well, de that's well, not simple. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but, but that's basically, yeah, that's the, basically the, the, now basically. how real realistic is this? I mean, uh, am I sending parents on a wild goose chase? Or if somebody out there says, okay, well, we can get a group together, we mm -hmm. can work hard for the next two to five years, mm -hmm. we can go out and recruit and so forth. Is, is this really a feasible thing? Would, would people who've gone through this process tell me that, yes, it can work? Well, it definitely can work. Um, it is hard work. Though. Yes, I would and imagine. And it's not for the faint of heart. You Absolutely. Know, it, you, you must be dedicated. You have to want this to happen. You have to be willing to explore, to learn, to research, to um, be able to do things like fundraising, okay. like any other nonprofit organization would. I mean, especially with the limited funds that you do get from and, the state. And by the way, you mentioned earlier th uh, that some schools may start only with state funding, does mm -hmm. that mean that there are external sources of funding for some schools as well? Correct. So how does the balance work in general? Uh, who generally, who, who's paying the most on average? Is it the state? Yes, And, and absolutely. that's about what, 90% of it, 75%? Well, let's say it, it depends on your budgeting, sure. right? But what I would say right now is we appro get approximately $6,000 per student All right. as a per pupil amount. You do have other supports like um, federal funds. All right. You know, those State, types the federal, of things. Right. Okay. And then if you have a, a child that has special needs, there's support for those um, kids coming from the uh, DOE system. Is there private sector funding coming into this? And there is private sector funding, but that depends upon your charter school. Sure. So, for instance, um, in Hawaii, uh, Kamehameha schools, they do help with some okay. Hawaiian focused schools. So um, some of the funding may come from, you know, uh, Kamehameha schools. There's other organizations and foundations that uh, have contributed to right. schools building buildings, you know, like the Harold K. Um, Castle Foundation sure. so, has helped. So people could go out and look for grants and exactly, other things. Exactly, exactly. And they're really, um, at this point in time in the charter school world, because charter schools don't receive facilities funding. So that's one real unfair inequity when you're looking at comparing apples to apples regarding sure. public support of charter well, schools. Well, I want to uh, move on to that now. Okay. Uh, talking okay. about uh, the benefits as well as the challenges, especially mm -hmm. that challenge in facilities. Mm -hmm. But first, uh, if you just sum up for our audience the scope of charter schools in Hawaii, how many there are, okay. how many students are in them, and, and how many students on average in each one. We're expecting about 10,500 students this year. Uh, we have 32 school, 33 schools now with the, our new school um, starting up this year. They range from very small schools, like we have one that serves the Ni'ihauen sure. uh, population, and we have two schools that do that, and they're between 30 and 60. And your largest school? And our largest school is over 1,000. So a total number of how many students are in charter schools? About 10,500 About 10,000, and yeah. how, how many students are there in the entire public school system? There's approximately, I think it's 180,000 okay, or so. Okay, so right now, 10,000 out of mm -hmm. 180,000 are about charter five, schools. About 5%. Students. That's right. Yes. Well, this is a fascinating discussion with Lynn Finnegan, the head of the Hawaii Public Charter Schools Network. I'm Kili'i Akina with Grassroot Institute. We'll be right back on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, Ehana Kako, right after this.
Aloha and welcome back to our final segment for today of Ehana Kako. Let's work together, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I want to say mahalo right now, of course, to our producer, Jay Fidel. Uh, he's doing a great job with his team, and aloha to all of the volunteers, including you, David, who are, are doing just a wonderful, wonderful job. Uh, today we're talking about education, and, and we want to draw some final conclusions now uh, as I speak with Lynn Finnegan, the executive director of the Hawaii Public Charter Schools Network. Lynn, uh, yes. this has been a fascinating conversation. I have to tell you, you've educated me. Oh, great. And, uh, That's what we want to do. And I think that this concept of Hawaii Public Charter Schools is worth going to bat for. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting development. Um, as you know, as president of Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, I care very deeply, we do care very deeply, about having an economy that has more options, that empowers people having a government that is transparent, mm -hmm. accountable to people, and plays an appropriate role, as well as having a society where individuals exercise free choice. Mm -hmm. And charter schools clearly seem to be a way to that. Yes. But I would imagine there may be some challenges. Absolutely. And so what is one of the biggest challenges you face in advocating for Hawaii public charter schools? Uh, I, you know, there's many challenges. I would say I would break it down into two different areas. One would be the area of funding. Okay. Um, you know, as a, a, a schools that operate outside of the main hub of schools, which is the Hawaii DOE, um, whenever you're looking at trying to increase funding, especially in the area of facilities, it's so hard to get that uh, increase of funding happening so at you, the state legislature. And when you talk about funding, then you're not necessarily talking about the salaries of the personnel because that's covered, isn't it? Uh, when $6,000 per person is allocated. Right. You're right. talking about other things that. Mainly facilities and facilities, equal share right. of the federal funding. So, so your share of the federal funding and your facilities. Correct. Because you don't go into a facilities base. No. So, how do charter schools currently handle that challenge of getting a facility? A lot of the times, so, so let's just say, like out of the $6,000. Um, they use their operational funds that should be going to, you know, computers, right. books, salaries, football teams, football teams, and all of that, and they're using that to either lease or build. Okay. Um, a place for them to. So have. land and buildings are absolutely crucial. Absolutely. Are there any solutions in which community organizations, whether they be businesses or mm -hmm. churches or mm -hmm. something else, are uh, comping them some measure of? facilities? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there's a total, well, yes and no. The Department of the uh, Hawaiian Homelands have done some leases All right. uh, in areas where, um, you know, those school, like schools like Hawaiihona over on the, um, on the Nanakuli side of sure. Oahu um, and over in Waimea on the Big Island. So there are situations where some of the land leases are. Well, let me just make a little note here. Okay. Uh, if you're watching now, and I know you do sometimes, <laughs> and you own an island here in the Hawaiian <laughs> Islands chain, Lynn good has plug, a wonderful, plug. wonderful uh, yes. a suggestion as to how you could use some, some of that land. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, then, how, how is the financial challenge faced? How, how do the proponents of a particular charter yes. school go about accomplishing the financial So goal? right now we're seeing a tremendous squeeze. They're squeezed between a rock and a hard place um, because in money like a like a business would operate they you know over the years they did their best to put aside some money as a cushion well, over these last few years, uh, that cushion right. has been going away. So now um, many of the charters are facing some really, really, not just tough decisions, because they've always had to make tough decisions, but they're really starting to become worried about right. whether or not they can exist. And, and that was a significant factor in the funding of the Hawaiian Immersion Language mm -hmm. Schools, mm -hmm. uh, which Office of Hawaiian Affairs provided significant funding for mm -hmm. just to keep them going in this past session. And that's where we're at. That's where we're at with charter schools. And so, um, wow, that's you a know, big, big challenge. Yeah, what, what do you think the solution is? Well, the solution, you know, the solution is to be able to um, fund charter schools through the legislature, through the general fund bu sure. budget, um, some support for each child, you know, um, so that they can have some facilities. How does the, the the dollar amount? Allocated for charter school students compared to the dollar amount allocated 
in the public traditional public school system? You know, there's all different calculations on how you can do that, but a straightforward number that we've come up with is about between like 12 and 1500 alone just on representing what the facilities differences are. Because we don't get, you know, basically if a community school gets built, it's paid all by the state. So in order to empower a more equitable choice mm -hmm. for, for parents and students as, as a state, yes. we're going to have to deal with that difference between what charter schools are getting and what the traditional schools are getting. Absolutely. Does and one this, clear way yes. is through facilities. Now, does this create any challenges in communicating the value of charter schools and advocating for absolutely. them? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, I think what you have is like parents will go and then they might see a campus and they say, well, but, you know, you're using a porta potty instead of having bathroom facilities. That's right. And there are parents and families and students who've they wanted that choice anyway, even if the facilities are less than or non-existent in some cases. Um, but they wanted that choice so badly that they went in that direction. I would I would offer that you know we shouldn't have to have those kids and families decide based upon whether or not they're going to have a porta potty or a or a you know bathroom facility. Um, what I would also say, because I'd like to get to the second part of the question, is like in Hawaii, we compare ourselves to the Hawaii Department of Education because that's the only other right. educational mm -hmm. institute that we have or organization that we have. Public, yes. Public. And, um, you know, one of the big differences is that when you have a one contract, whether it be HSTA or HGA or UPW, when you have one collective bargaining contract for a group of employees, it makes it very difficult to have the innovative type of programs. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to just get rid of um, unions, because we haven't done that in Hawaii, and we've been able to do some in, in innovation within charter schools. But what that does mean is coming and collaborating, coming to the table and saying, this particular agreement does not fit for the kind of education that we want to give to our kids. Um, a case, an example is we have this wonderful organization that is looking at how do we get kids who have dropped out to come back to school? How do we deal with these issues where they may have an incarcerated parent or they may have these real serious challenges to get them back to school? And um, there's a there's an organization out there is looking at how do we get social you know counseling and and you know uh, job skill training and all of that. Well, when you have some really needy types yes. of right. kids, you need people to work on staff that have flexible schedules. Absolutely. You know, if a child is calling because they're out. Um, they've run away or whatever and they're not going to go back to school and they need counseling or support you know 12 o'clock in the evening or whether you know maybe they find themselves in a situation where they're in Waikiki you know whatever the situation mm -hmm. is so you uh, need that yes. flexibility and mm -hmm. and at this point in time because of the way some of our um, collective uh, bargaining uh, agreements are it's really tough to get to that point where you'd have the flexibility to do these right. creative programs do you think that the need which you have identified for programs that have greater flexibility than mm -hmm. what you might find in the traditional public school. Um, do you think that that need can motivate the unions and the school system itself mm -hmm. to see the value of having the charter schools out there so that resources can flow your way a little better and, and support in terms of union contracts and mm -hmm. support flow your way. Well, let me just give credit to yes. um, HSTA and others who have come to the table and have allowed for legislators who have come to the table and allowed for what we call supplemental agreements. And in these supplemental right. agreements, you can make changes. But oftentimes, it's a little tweaking here, a little Absolutely. tweaking there. And in, in times where you're really looking at trying to create a very innovative program, a lot of the times in which the teachers at that school do embrace, and they want to have that flexibility to do that, we've just got to get better at being able to say and answer that question and communicate effectively with the public and the unions at large that we're doing this and uh, we're doing this to help, you know, meet the needs where kids may not have those yes, needs being met. that's definitely the case. Well, you know, Lynn, I know that your heart is collaborative, absolutely. And uh, I think one of the problems that we've had in the past is we've expected our school system to do everything. Exactly. And so the, there's a huge challenge. Uh, my hat goes off to Don Horner and um, Ms. Matayoshi because this is doing do anything everything. is te teaching the elephant, elephant to dance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Charter schools seems to be, however, one of the answers to that need by taking uh, a sm much smaller scale at creating innovative solutions. And creating that, focus. Yes. So, there you know, you if you have science and technology, yes, sure, you have to make sure that you're delivering on English scores and there all of that go. writing mm -hmm. scores and everything. But you have a focus, so you might build the best team, you know, for science, technology, engineering, and math, and that's what helps that's you, right. mm -hmm. you know, get through to the kids. Or Hawaiian culture, you might build that best team, and through that, through that focus, that you might be able to have these kids that you know are participating right. more than they would. And I, I like the fact that you, you talk about focus, because you can do something with a startup charter school or an existing charter school uh, that you can't do with larger institutions. Mm -hmm. And the the best solution is to see that charter schools are part of the solution absolutely to public education mm -hmm. and education altogether in Hawaii and when it's when there's a tandem solution working you know the, the, the huge problem of managing the, the larger institution but the workable problem of managing small focus oriented charter schools mm -hmm. I think we can have a system that works together that's why absolutely. we say we say and it has been working <laughs> you know it has been working that's where right. you have communities stepping up to the plate and engaging in their schools, um, and that's uh, that's a very positive thing. I think uh, I, I think the the results are going to be even better than they were before mm -hmm. regarding charter schools and their successes. And I hope that you know more people will help will understand us. One of the difficulties is that you know we're individual schools Absolutely. versus a system of schools. Well, Lynn, I want to thank you so very much for being here today. It's with my us. pleasure. And uh, ehana kako means let's work together and I think what we've uh, seen today is that uh, Lynn Finnegan is a champion for working together trying to find solutions uh, to a very difficult and challenging issue but one we have to win on mm -hmm. we have to educate our children and so I want to thank you for being with us today my, my, my guest has been Lynn Finnegan executive director of the Hawaii Public Charter Schools Network I'm Kaylee Akina president of Grassroot Institute of Hawaii and you've been watching Ehana Kako Let's work together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Much aloha to you. Thank Lynn, you. thank you so much. It's my Good. pleasure.